The 2023 general elections in Nigeria is about seven months away. Being a developing nation with a relatively young democracy compared to others, the role of the media cannot be overemphasized. With such a huge population, the Nigerian media has a lot to do to make sure that voters get all the information they need to perform their civic duties during the elections. Now, given that Nigerian democracy is still nascent, uh, the job of the media in trying to shape it is a very critical one. And this means that even though the media has been trying to do its best in terms of reportage and editorial analysis of the political and elect electoral pro processes, there's still a lot more that needs to be done, and that's why we're going to be having this conversation tonight. And joining me to discuss this live in the studio is Achike Chude. He's a political analyst. And of course, uh, joining us again is uh, Mustafa Issa. He's the president's Nigerian Guild of Editors. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us in the studio. My pleasure. This is a great conversation. Thanks for having me. I'm excited that we're having this conversation. But, but I'm going to start with you, um, Mr. Issa, being that you're a journalist. Uh, and, and in my opening, I did say that. Um, the media is doing a lot. We have a lot on our plate already, of course. And when it's at about this time, the NBC sends us settlers upon settlers and what to broadcast and what not to broadcast. But we can also get you know, caught up with all the political gists, making headlines, and forget about the civic responsibility that we all have. And I want to ask you, why do we always have to pinch ourselves or remind ourselves that we all have a job to do, especially at this time of the year? I think um, we, we, I'm also a broadcaster. Um, the, the, the reminder sent by the NBC, I think a few weeks ago to all of us, um, we just to let us know that there are rules guiding the uh, covering um, politics in, in Nigeria. But some of us have all done our e-house uh, training for our reporters to know what to do, I want to do. For instance, uh, you are not permitted to announce results. Even when you have all the um, results, I mean, in the state or across the country, it is job of the, uh, the, the, the IMEC to officially announce the results. Hmm. But again, uh, I think, uh, you know, Nigeria is a very politically aware uh, nation, let me put it that way. And, uh, you know, years back, there was this fear by the government that should we even liberalize the broadcast sector? The fear is that it could be used you know, to overthrow, I mean, the uh, um, government. That fear is even more there. That is why the regulation we, we, we will have in the, in the broadcast is different from the one of the, the newspapers, uh, I mean, the print. It, but again, as elections draw near, we should remind ourselves that we have a country. We remind ourselves that let us address the critical issues of. About assume much of attacks on individuals, mm -hmm. not addressing the issues as it concerns the people. And I'm worried about that really. And, and uh, we, we, we should know that in the past, you know, we focused too much on the people. We didn't question those who could have for to be elected. I had a day the one election, then we are duped. I hope to repeat myself again this in 2023. Hmm. Let me come to you, Achike. He tried to give us, you know, reasons why the broadcast media was almost not allowed to, you know, uh, grow as it should, fear, for the fear of, you know, being used as a tool of overthrowing. Uh, but let's assess the media from 1999 till now and look at where, how far we've come and if we're still growing in lips and bounds. I've been to several African countries. The media is not as strong or has a voice as much as we do in Nigeria. Even though we complain that we seem to be stifled, there seems to be some space, you know, for us to be able to do some things. But I wanted to ask him that question. I'm going to toss it to you. Why do we have to wait till election season to find our voices, especially in the civic space? Why can't it be a continuous no, conversation? No, I, I think we've always found our voices. But then again, I think the question is uh, what kind of voices? What is the quality of voice? What kind of value? you know, uh, do our voices add to mm -hmm. the, you know, civic uh, space? Uh, because voices could be different. Voices could be positive. Voices could be pro-people. Mm. Voices could be pro-Nigeria. Voices could also be negative. 
you, you know, and don't also forget that, uh, yes, we have a very vibrant me media again, but what is the level of vibrancy? Vibrancy could be positive, it could be negative. Mm. It could be the vibrancy that, uh, you know, propagates and uh, insists on, you know, having a free uh, civic space. It could be the kind of vibrancy also that uh, aims, you know, to attack or attacks the free civic space and all that. Mm. So, you know, but, but, but the, the reality is that when you look at democracy itself as a process, as a political, you know, process, uh, and you look at even the basic definition of democracy as government or the people for the people and all that, there are certain ideals that democracy promises. Mm. And that's why when when you know you you talk about um, you know democracy there are certain elements that accompany you know democratic pra practice you know they talk about um, e e e uh, uh, um, uh, of course uh, the, the the proper practice of a democracy but uh, uh, the the media the role of the media or the performance of the media is crucial is critical mm -hmm. in fact people have tended to say that when you want to find out or determine the degree of freeness or openness of the civic space in a country. Look at the degree of development of the media. Mm. And then that will give you an idea whether the country is free or not. That is how important you know, the media is. And, and if you're looking at it from the Nigerian context, you realize that uh, at least the framers of the constitution also had a, you know, a disbelief you know, about the importance of the media. Uh, and that is why the media it has a constitutional provision, mm. essentially, so that nobody could can take it away. Mm. Uh, but, but again, uh, the, also the political elites haven't also understood the importance of the media. Has of, have also moved into that space. So you you and 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 they, ha, they are there also exercising some level of control over the media. So when you now begin to talk about, for instance, even the freedom of the media itself. It, it is not, you know, something that is a given. Mm. In most cases, you find out that the media space is, you know, the civic space is restricted because the media space is restricted mm. as a result of the ownership of media houses, powerful media houses, you know, by uh, powerful elites. Uh, and, and that obviously will not go well uh, for the, uh, you know, uh, maintenance of a, of a democracy, you know, within uh, the politics. So when you look at it from 1999 to date, you could say yes, Nigeria has always had vi vibrant media. Mm -hmm. But you can also not separate about Nigeria also has all manners of endemic uh, problems, you know, bedeviling the country. So you cannot also remove the media from some of these problems, you know, in the country. Uh, but it, it, I think what is of importance, and that's what a lot of people tend to, uh, uh, you know, uh, overlook, is the fact that having a democracy in place does not, or having a civilian administration in place does not imply, you know, that you're having a democracy in government. place. Yes. Because some of the worst dictators who, who you know, uh, attacked, you know, African dictators now, to be specific, who constantly attacked the civic space, were people who were supposedly elected by the people, they were not military uh, dictators, they were civilians. civilians. And so there is always that tendency that for us to tend to equate freedom, you know, and uh, an open civic space with, uh, you know, uh, the democracy. It doesn't always follow. Mm. Because like I said, you have dictators that are also in control or try to manipulate the free civic space and try to restrict, uh, you know, freedom of expression, try to restrict the media. Uh, uh, you know, in the process of governance, and that becomes a problem. So I think, by and large, the media has has relatively done well mm. from 1999 to date. But when you also look at the fact that the media, really, in most cases, is not in the hands of core professionals who understand the ideals of democracy, and and I mean, who understand the ideals of journalism, of journalism, of journalism and who will do everything to protect the uh, you know, media space, you realize that we have, you're going to continue to have this conflict where the media tends to uh, act in ways that might, might not be in tandem with fulfilling the ideals or, or the purposes of the media. I'm going to come to you, Mr. Isa, because he's shaking a table that uh, I, I am on. Um, he's talking about the fact that um, a lot of elites, political elites this time, own media houses, many of those where we work in. I've had conversations with journalists about how stories are being told and what perspectives these stories are being told and how it affects 
you know, the civic space and how people perceive us. Um, again, what can we possibly do? As yes, Elias stated, because we have we ha we need these jobs. We have to do our jobs, but then we are somewhat constricted to certain narratives or certain ways of reportage. So how can we really say that we're doing the duties of journalists and fulfilling the duties of the fourth estate of the realm, that is Nigeria? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, people like Achike, they, they talk about ownership of the media. Um, it, 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 it didn't start today, my sister. Even before independence, those who fought for independence also own media houses. Zik of Africa owned a media house. He was Africa pilot. All of us had tribune and he said that he says today. So he didn't start to do the ownership of my politicians. But the question is, what are we supposed to do as professionals working in those media houses? For instance, if I'm restricted from reporting because my boss is belong to one political party. There are other media that can that will report. Mm. That is why I'm happy that you have to have plurality of the media. Nobody can kill a story anymore in this country. Because if you feel that this media house can't take this, others will take it. Mm. And that is why today, people like Achik Echili, for instance, if others does want to invite him to their programs, others will invite him. Nobody will go to close his voice. Mm. So my primary concern is this. Professionals who work in those media houses, what are their tendencies? Are they professionals? Do they stick to their ethics or their profession? If you, no matter who you work for, no matter the house you work, you must adhere to the ethics of your profession as a journalist. That is the way I see it. Others speak to it. still be a threat. Uh. It is started to end today, even across the, I mean, the entire world. Politicians own media houses. That is true. But look at the way they operate. Even in America today, look at it. You know, even media houses take positions mm. on issues. Some are pro Republican, some are pro Democrat. Same thing in the UK. So we are taking a, a different shape. That is why it's plurality. If you don't like the particular session, you know the other one. All of us can operate the same. That is that is why I'm not scared of saying. As much as as much as I agree, I agree with you, Mr. Issa, As much as I agree with you with the fact that there might be different narratives or different perspectives to it, that's a that's a system that has been mastered. So that you know that there is the Republicans and there are the Democrats and then there are the Independents. But I mean, let's not even go to how grown our democracy is and how nascent it is. But then let's look at misinformation at the core of this, because in a bid to also want to not play to the narrative. Um, of one person or trying to tell the story differently, there can be misinformation. How do we deal with that? Again, at the core of it is the ethics of journalism, which you clearly asked. What exactly. is, yes. yes. So how, how do you manage that? Because there are times that people are misinformed because we're trying to douse tension or because of what party our boss belongs to. We try not to tell the story or be, be alarmist. Uh, some will say, well, let's not be alarmist. Let's just try to douse tension. Let's look at what the federal government is saying, or the Ministry of Information has said to Daily Trust for breaking a story. Now, the federal government is taking a position of glamorizing the issue as opposed to unearthing truths that would, might help us to fight terrorism in the country. So in that regard, how do we deal with it? How do we deal with the issue? Let's leave the BBC. It's not a Nigerian media house, but then there's a Daily Trust in the matter. Yeah. The issue of fake news is worldwide now because of social media. With, with Twitter um, data, you can have access to whatever channel and you write anything you want to write. Those guys doing that are not journalists, really. Even if somebody call them citizen journalism, they are not trained. We are the professionals. That's what I'm saying. If you work in a media house, are you acting as a professional? The issue of fake news is not peculiar to Nigeria. It's all over the world today. Where Trump was president of the U.S., he said about fake news throughout his four years he was in power. But he couldn't do anything about the issue of fake news. People now, they just manufacture a quote and attribute it to me or to anybody. Mm. You know, so, but please, you should get that with the issue of the traditional media. 
I have seen a lot of stories that flat on social media. You can hardly find them in the traditional media. You know why? Because those guys, they have what we call gatekeepers. Mm. Not every story you see that you put, because a gatekeeper is there to check the veracity. It doesn't mean that sometimes we don't goof. Mm. And what we do, I will tell my guy, please apologize. Oh no. If you see any story, please, before you publish, before you broadcast, check from two or more sources before you go on air, because it is better for you to keep your integrity intact. You know, first times, some of us just want to do breaking news, and in the process, we don't check properly. That is why some of us are the team of that. So, but to me, as a professional, I will train the school to always check for two or more things before I, I, I so, go so ahead and use the story. If in doubt, if in of, doubt uh, leave out. Uh, but but I, I quickly, yeah. I'll come back to you. Let me come to Achike. Achike, I, yeah. I don't want to re-ask the question, but you know what I mean. Um, in a case where the media is going above and beyond to try, because again, it, it seems like we're in, in, a, in between a rock and a hard place in terms of fighting terrorism in this country and the body language that the government is giving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but then we see a media house who's gone above and beyond to tell a story. They risk their life to bring this story. And then the government is saying, we're going to punish you. Um, for telling this story because we think that you're glamorizing terrorism. But these people are saying, we're trying to also find, make sense of why this war continues. Uh, how, where, does, where, does, where do you start from in dealing with this? Because again, this is talking about controlling the media or arm twisting the media. You know, you know the interest of the president uh, of your country, sometimes it's not necessarily the interest of the people that he governs. The interest of a political party might not be synonymous with the interest of the people that uh, the party, I mean, you know, it's in charge of, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, if it's the dominant political party, the party in government. You know, so sometimes there's always that tendency for them to want to protect uh, the, the president, to, for them to want to protect uh, the, you know, position of government and all that. You know, but what I tell people really is that a president, for instance, is supposed to be the symbol of the nation. But there are times when the interest of state, you know, state actors might be at variance with the interest of the country. Mm. You know, so where do you draw the line at that particular point in time? Because just like you, 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 you talked about, of course, the government was very upset. Mm -hmm. But was the report actually glamorizing uh, the, the terrorists or not? People have said that perhaps the story could have been done in another way. Perhaps they did not need to put the faces of the terrorists, I mean, in view for Nigerians to see and all that. Maybe but the government the point has there. said that they don't yeah. know these people. So yeah. giving a face to these people, Go. does it not help no, in no, any way? This is the issue for a government that is very serious. Because what those people have done, in fact, it was even surprising that the terrorists themselves agreed to show their, 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 you know, their faces. The normal thing, the normal thing is that they would have hidden their faces mm. because of the fear of elimination by the government. But obviously, what that, 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 uh, that um, program, you know, what uh, the, it, it, the, the whole thing, the documentary showed us is one, that these terrorists are in control and that they are not afraid of the government. They are not afraid of repercussions. That they were there confessing to brazen crimes against the Nigerian state without you know, even thinking of caution, the need for them to hide their identity so that the government will not seek them out. Just a few days ago, or was it yesterday, today, we heard that uh, uh, Azawari, you know, the leader of Al-Qaeda, had been taken out by the American government. That is what is expected, that having exposed themselves in the way and manner they did, that they were working on a thin line. Of course, we know, and you see the hypocrisy, because there must be some level of consistency. Yes, Gumi and his supporters are not journalists, so yeah. perhaps there's a higher standard expected of journalists. Yeah. But we have seen that exactly what the, the, the Daily Trust and the BBC did is what, for instance, Sheikh Gumi has been doing. He has been in the forest, in and out, with these terrorists, taking pictures, smiling with them, armed with guns, and nothing has happened. And so, perhaps the government felt uncomfortable because that documentary was going to lead people to ask questions that they have always been asking. Are there more things that we need to know about this government and the involvement of government officials with these terrorists that a lot of us do not know? You know, why has it become a problem? Why are the terrorists not, you know, afraid to uh, uh, show their faces? 
uh, because that would clearly mark them out for elimination by a government that is serious to tackle you know terrorism why is and then again uh, the reporters, the, 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 the Daily Trust reporters and the BBC, with the terrorists, were they not also afraid? Or did they extract any, uh, any promise by the Daily Trust uh, you know, reporters, for instance, that they are not going to divulge the locations where they met them? Because these are the things that every yeah. security agency would be interested in. So if it was a serious government, what they would have, they would have done is to try to get uh, some of the journalists that participated in that interview, in that program to give them clues about where these terrorists are because they have always told us that some, you know, most times that they don't know where they are. Mm. They don't know where they are operating at. But other people know. And again, another question that comes up is, if these people, with the level of knowledge they have, which is not as, as good as that of Nigeria's intelligence agencies, mm -hmm. could actually, through whatever means, be able to locate these this, this, uh, terrorists and engage them you know, prior to having this uh, you know, documentary, are you saying that, that our trained intelligence operatives do not have what it takes to infiltrate the ranks of these terrorists and all that? So I think that the government was being defensive in the condemnation of uh, the, 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 the journalists that partook or took part in that uh, you know, program. But just like you also uh, said, every such uh, endeavor entails risks. Mm. These journalists took risks they could have been eliminated by these people because these are people that do not have any moral scruples. These are people that have killed without provocation, innocent people. So for you now to go into the forest and also come out, you know, unscathed, it's simply, I mean, we must celebrate the, bra the bravery that some of these journalists showed. And I think for me that that is, you know, the right kind of journalism. But then again, people would argue that there are certain ethics, ethical boundaries that were, that, were, that were broken. So it's subject to interpretation, really. We do not have time, but we're going to continue having this conversation. But I, lastly, I want to ask you a question, Mr. Isa, before you go. Um, how do we expect the media to grow, especially now that... We're talking about the civic space, educating the, the civic space on what to do uh, before, during, and after the elections. And, and this, of course, includes who the person they should vote for uh, should be. I mean, that's obviously going to be different. It would differ for me, for GK, <coughs> for you. But then going to, the, to, to where these terrorists were, to tell the story from a journalistic perspective, as opposed to all the stories that we've been hearing from our uh, leaders, security agencies. This is a story from a, a journalist and getting punished for it. How encouraging is that for us as journalists in mm. this country and going forward? Why would anybody mm. want to join this profession if we're being um, this gagged or this punished at every opportunity in closing? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, journalists do not create events. We only report events that have happened. Yes. It is true that Session 8 of the Code of Ethics for Journalists, developed by the NUJ, the Guild of Editors, and the Super, the super Proprietors, Session 8 says a journalist should not present or report acts of violence, armed robberies, terrorist activities, or vulgar display of wealth in a manner that glorifies such acts in the eye of the public. I have watched that BBC and Trust TV documentary. I didn't see anywhere they glamorize terrorism at all. At all. In fact, they should be commended for doing that job. That is it. For people showing their faces, if we, the country had um, good um, records of all citizens, you should have used it to even track those guys. But of course, nothing like that has happened. Mm. You know, so we will not be deterred. We are doing our job. Okay. Even in the Western countries, we, where Osama Bin Laden was alive, yeah. media houses interview we have, them. We have to and go they use this interview. We have to you go. Know, so, uh, but going forward, I please my colleagues, I told the three elections drawn there, that please interrogate the issues, ask all the candidates critical okay. questions. All right. So that Nigeria will be in a better position to make informed choices. Thank you. All right. I want to say thank you, Mr. Isa, for joining us. I want to say thank you, Chikichude. It's very important that we continue it, having this conversation. It, it, but it's, time, it's critical. It, time yes. is really, you know, of the essence. But time is not but on we, our yeah, side. We yeah, will I be agree. back to have this same kind of conversation. I am Mary Anna Korn. I'll see you tomorrow on Plus Politics as we talk for development. Have a good evening.